Well, okay. I did say in the last video that we would talk about this Quran, the Hafs Quran. This is the Quran that we all use. This is the Quran that is the authoritative Quran. Uh, Hafs is the name of the fellow who was, uh, at, at, it's been attributed to. Uh, we'll talk more about that. And I said that I wanted to really delve into why they chose this particular Kira'at, this particular reading, this particular transmission, this Rawi. Why did they choose this one? And who chose it? And for what reason? So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get right into it and let's go back to the PowerPoint and let's start with the PowerPoint. So what about the Hafs Quran? Compiled supposedly by this man named Hafs in 796. Remember the 10 readers that we referred to in the previous videos? We have Nafi and Ibn Kathir and Abu Amr and Ibn Amir and Asim, Hamza and Al Qasai. Those are the first seven. They're the ones in green. Those are the first ones chosen by Ibn Mujahid. And then we went to Abu Jafar and added uh, Yaqub and then also Khalaf. And so it made 10, 10 of them, three uh, from the later period and seven from the former period. These are the best of the best. These are the creme de la creme that Yasser Qadi um, refers to. Then we looked at the 20 transmitters. Maybe we talked about the transmitters. These are the ones that were chosen by Ibn Mujahid and later the other th uh, six were chosen by Al Jazari, but they were the ones chosen two for each one of the readers. Now, you, we do know from the last video that there were many more than this. In fact, it is almost 100 uh, that could have been chosen between the 8th century and the 10th century. Nonetheless, these are the official 20 that you see there in purple that have been chosen as transmitters. So that gives us a total of 30. And from within those 30, notice the one that has been chosen for today is this guy here, Hafs, the one I've got circled in black. He is the one uh, that I just held up. He is the one that you see here. This is the Hafs. And if you go back to the graph, take a look. He is from Asim. Uh, he is from Kufa. Hugely important. Uh, and we're going to find a little bit about him, and we're going to ask some questions. Because the question I want to ask is, was he a good choice? Was he the best of the 30? Should he have been chosen? Out of all those 30 they had to choose from, we now know it's actually hundreds. But nonetheless, these are the official 30 that are known of today. These are the official ones that the Muslims talk about today. Should they have chosen him? And I say, no, he was not the best choice. Here's why. I have three problems. And I'm going to go through all three of them. First and most important, he just wasn't trustworthy. Not suitable at all to be a kira'at. Not only a kira'at transmitter, but the one and the final one and the canonical one that they use today. 90% of the Muslim world, this is the one that is used. He is the one that is used. More so, and this is the curious thing, and this is where I'm not hearing Muslims talked about. When they choose their kira'ats or when they choose their readers, they don't use any textual criticism to do so. When, when we looked at our Bible and when we looked and, and saw how it, it was to be chosen, manuscript after manuscripts, 24,000 manuscripts that they had to look from, they had a good 10,000 Latin Vulgates, they had 5,800 Greek manuscripts, 9,000 others in other languages. Goodness sakes, 24,000 of they could choose. What, what did they do? They didn't go and say, well, I like these guys because they live here, or I like these because they're popular. No, they went to look and see which had the text that could be traced back to its earliest origins. They always went back to the earliest origins. You notice that's what I've been doing in all these talks. I've always wanted to know what is from the 7th century. I want to know what is coming from that time period when Islam began, when Muhammad see these, received these revelations. So they should have done what, well, I think anybody who's a textual critic should do, and that is go to the original text. Go to the earliest text. If you don't have the originals, go to that which is the earliest. And how do you know that? Well, find out and date them, and then see if they compare. And, and, and was this why how Huffs was chosen? Absolutely not. They didn't do anything like that, as we saw from the last video. <laughs> they really just chose who was the most popular, who had the most number of of 
other transmitters that came below them? Who had the most number of people that actually used them and gave authority to them? And in some cases, where they lived. Like Warsh. He was from Egypt. And the other three were from, well, they were from, sorry, they were from Medina. But they didn't like him because they wanted someone from Egypt. So can you see it was for the wrong reason? This has nothing to do with textual criticism. This has everything to do with popularity contest. Or trying to get as many different readers from as many different areas. And then thirdly, I would suggest that Huffs was the last person they should have chosen. Amongst the 30, he was the least capable and the least suitable to have been chosen. Let's go and see what I mean by that. So let's delve in to see who this guy Huffs was. But before that, we need to look at his, well, we need to look at his reader. The, the guy that actually he came from, the guy whose stable or tribe or family he originated from. And his name was Asim. It was his reader. His real name is Asib ibn uh, Abi al-Najud. And he was from Kufa. Kufa. That is just south of Baghdad. So that's Iraq. Remember that. Remember that. Now, we are told that he received his Quran from Zar ibn Hubais. This is Asim. Uh, received his Quran from Zar ibn Hubais, from Abu Abd al-Rahman and al-Sulami and Abu Amr al-Shaibani. We supposedly received it from Al Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the fourth caliph, and also from Ibn Masud, from Kufa. Fascinating. We don't have any of this. This is just attribution. This is nothing more than they tell us that he received it from them. We don't have any uh, Quran from Abi ibn Talib. We don't have any from Ibn Masud. These are only the traditions from the 9th and 10th century traditions attributed to these guys. The earliest Qurans we have are really these readers, Asim. He is the earliest one we have, and that's why we're talking about him. That's why we're looking at him, and that's why we're really looking at between the 8th and the 10th century. These are the ones between the 8th and 10th century. You can't get back any earlier than that. There is no Quran for us to look at uh, from the 7th century, from the companions of the Prophet, uh, which uh, Ibn Masud and Ali ibn Abi Talib would be from. And then we're said... People spoke about Asim. Now we're getting to the 8th century, and let's see what the people said about Asim. Because he is the one that we, that's all we've got. We've only got his Quran to go on. And let's see what people said about his reading, about his Quran. Well, Ibn Saad said this, Asim was reliable, but made many mistakes in the transmission. Ooh, okay. Abd Allah Ibn Ahmed said this, Al-Amash memorized tradition more correctly than Asim. Okay. Yaqub bin Sufyan said his transmission of the tradition contains some confusion. Hmm. Interesting. Ibn Ulaya said everyone named Asim was faulty in memorizing the tradition. Okay. So he doesn't like people with that name Asim. And Ibn Qarash said this. His transmission of the tradition contains some deniable things. al uqaili had this to say about Asim. He had no problem with Asim except poor memorization of the tradition. And Al Darakutni said this of Asim that he had a faulty memory. Hamad ibn Salma finally said Asim became confused towards the end of his life. So not much to go on. There's not much here that I would say just proves that Asim was one of the best of the best or the creme de la creme. Not from what I'm seeing here, okay? Nonetheless, he is the one that starts that whole tradition from Kufa of which Hafs comes from. So now let's go to Hafs. Let's see what Hafs said. Let's see what we know about Hafs and see if maybe he's better. Maybe he did better than Asim, his predecessor. Now to Hafs. His name was Hafs ibn Sulaiman al-Asadi from Kufa, born in 508, died in, I'm sorry, born in 708, died in 796. Raised by Asim in Kufa, so he was raised from the family, knew him, spent some time with him, though Asim would be about 50 years older than him. Hafs said this of himself, that he did not depart from Asim's reading except in one word in Surat al-Hurum. So really, and here's the question I have, if he didn't depart from Asim in one word, then why are we using Hafs? Why don't we just go to Hafs Asim? If it's exactly the same except for one word, then why aren't we going to Asim? 
Well, the reason is because there were quite a big difference between Asif and Hafs. And this is what the, the Muslims are not doing. They're not giving us all these differences. We've got to go through and pull them out ourselves. But it's obvious uh, that they use Hafs and not Asim for a reason, because they were different. Otherwise, we would be going to Asim, wouldn't we? We'd be using Asim all over the world and not Hafs, who obviously had some differences between the two. Now, this is what the others say about him. Let's go back and see what they say about him. Al Dahabi says this, Hafs was reliable in his reading, consistent and accurate, but not so in the transmission of his tradition. Ibn Abi Hattim says this, his Hafs transmission of the tradition was rejected. Oh, do Uthman al Darmi and others agreed with him, said he was not reliable. Ibn al Madina, Medini said, Hafs was weak in the tradition and I intentionally avoided transmitting from him. Al-Buhari, the famous Al-Buhari of the Hadith, said he was rejected by the compilers of biographical dictionaries. And finally, Al-Nasai said, I consider him untrustworthy and the traditions he transmitted were not recorded. But that's not all. Others had other things to say. Here are some other opinions. We have Al-Darakutni declared him to be weak. Al-Saji said, Hafs is one of those whose traditions have disappeared. What he transmitted contained objectionable traditions. Sali ibn Muhammad had this to say of him. His traditions were not recorded, and all of them were objectionable. Finally, ibn Kharas has this to say. Hafs was a liar and was rejected for fabricating traditions. Ibn Hayyim said this. He used to change the chains of transmission and even fabricated chains for those traditions that did not have ones. Oof. So what do we see here? He was unreliable, he was weak, he was untrustworthy, he contained objectionable material, he con it con his material contained fabricated chains, his traditions disappeared, he was a liar. His transmissions were not recorded by others and others avoided him. To the point that Abd al-Rahman al, al declares this, I solemnly declare that it is not permissible to transmit traditions on his, Huff's authority. Folks, why in the world was then Huff chosen as the official Quran for today if, as we're seeing here, he is so unreliable and so untrustworthy? Well, let's go and see how he was chosen. Maybe that will give us some idea as to what's going on. So, how was he canonized? How was his text canonized as the chosen text for today all over the world? Well, we do know that in 1924, so we're talking about the last century, 96 years ago, they were having problems in the high schools there in Cairo, in the city of Cairo, just the city of Cairo. And so the educational authority came together and they decided we've got to do something about this because whenever they had tests on the Quran, whenever they had standardized tests, they had anything but standardized <laughs> responses or answers. They were getting all kinds of answers, with all kinds of references as people were reciting and writing down what they knew of this verse and that verse. They were getting about 30 different answers for every question. So they had to do something. And so they, they went to Al-Azhar University and they went to Muhammad ibn Al, Ali al-Husayni al-Haddad who was one of the scholars there at al Azhar University in 1925, and they asked him if he would choose from amongst the 31, just one, that they could use to then use for their standardized tests, and he chose Hafs. He chose Hafs. doesn't really say why he chose it, but we pretty well know the reason why today, because that was the 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 Gerat that the Ottoman Empire used. And remember, the Ottoman Empire was very much still in power and they were uh, they were just uh, actually they lost their power in that year 1924 so that was the one they used it was the ottoman empire that liked that one and they were the ones that had been using it in all of their official business and so that it made stand reason that he wanted to choose his one so that was chosen so what did they do with the other 29 well they took and gathered up all the other 29 gira that disagreed with us they took it out and they took it out into a boat and they threw it into the Nile and let it sink into the river, the Nile, thinking that they had solved the problem. <laughs> As we well know today, they did not solve the problem at all because we now know that you can get them all over the world. In fact, Hatun is able to be able to get all of them, including th seven others on top of that. So you can see, you can buy them. In fact, you can go up online and you can buy them yourself. 
I just finished ordering seven of them uh, from Jordan. They're going to come to me. And so that's why they're easily available even today, almost 100 years later, 96 years later, you can still get them. It didn't help for them to throw them into the Nile. Now, here is a picture of Hattun's. Take a look here. She's got 37. That's seven more than the official Kira'at. So you can get them in, uh, go into bookstores in Arab lands. You're, here you can see Bernie Powers from Australia. He was with me two weeks ago. We, he showed this picture of his 23 Kira'at Qurans. So you can see they're readily available. There should be no problem getting them. When you look at these different Kira'at, this is a graph that Hutton did a number of years ago. There you can see the five cities of Mecca, Medina, Basra, Al Kufa, and Syria uh, in the different colors. And on the right are all the different transmitters. And there's 20 of them there. And when you look at those numbers in those little brown clouds, those are the differences that you can see from each one of the transmitters with Hufs, the one I've circled there in black. Not just a few, not just a few tens, not just a few hundreds, some cases thousands of differences. The team of Hatstoon there in London, her team has already found 93,263 differences. 93,263 differences that she has already found. Ooh, tu -tu 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 -tu. So you can see this is not inconsequential. To say that it doesn't matter, that they all say the same thing, have any of the people who are saying this, has Shabir Ali or Yasser Qadi, who keep claiming this, that there's no difference in doctrine, there's no difference in meaning, there's no difference in practice, there's no difference in belief. Have they looked at all those 93,000? Has anybody looked at those 93,000 to make a judgment like that? Were they even aware of the 93,000? I don't know of anybody. I've never seen a Muslim who's done any work on it. I've never seen of anybody who's published any work on these variants. We're the first one to go public with it. Hatun is the first one to actually make, even come up with a number. To say nothing of the fact that when we finally showed just six of them a few weeks ago, Hatun and I, and also Al-Fadi, Shabir Adi, he just went on a rant and a rave for about an hour and a half trying to shut that down, saying, no, these don't make any difference. Okay, so they look different, so they have different meanings, but they don't change any doctrine, no ch they don't change any belief, they don't change any practice. He kept on repeating that. For those who were watching, it could see that he was lying. Of course they do change it. You can do see it. They do change the meaning. Now, that's for another argument. I let the Arabs do that argument, the Arab speakers who know this as the, and have this as their mother tongue. Let's talk about Hafs himself. Hafs, we know, doesn't just have one Quran because Hatun has been able to come up with seven different Hafs Qurans. So which of these seven is the one that he actually wrote? Now, we do know which one has been chosen, but what about the other six? Which is the one that actually comes from his manuscript from 796? I'd like to know. That we're not told yet, and that has yet to be uh, looked at. We do know that, however, in 1936, then, uh, about 12 years later, that Huff's Quran was then chosen as the official Quran for all the schools in all of Egypt so that they could standardize their tests. That was in 1936. It was called the Farouk edition because it was named after King Farouk, who took power in that year. And then in 1985, 35 years ago, the government of Saudi Arabia realized how efficient the Egyptian model was and they decided to make the Huff standard for all Qurans for the whole world, including where we are right now, including where you are, those of you who are watching this. This was known as the Fad edition because it was named after King Fad, who, uh, who was in power from 1982. So that we're talking about just 35 years ago that this Quran here has finally been made the official text. This is the official one that is used all over the world today. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. They chose the Huff's one? Let's go back. Let's back up. Let's back up. Remember this? I put this up a number of weeks ago. Matz Sahih al-Buhari, volume 6, hadith number 510. Remember that? Remember I put that up there? That's where you find out the story of how the Quran was put together. That comes from the ninth, late 9th century, about 870, when al-Buhari was writing in volume 6, hadith number 510, how the Quran was actually compiled. Remember what he said? There you can see it, it's all there in Arabic on the right and on the left is the English translation. Let me summarize it, let me remind you. Remember what I said back then and I'll remind you right now. 
there was a battle up in Azerbaijan around 652. So Uthman was in power, he was in Medina, and many of his uh, soldiers had gone up to fight against the Azerbaijanis. Along with them came some other Muslims from Syria and also from Iraq, from Kufa and Basra, those cities. They came up and they were all fighting together and they would then go to the mosque to pray. And in the mosque, these Meccans and these Medinans, uh, these people from the Hejaz, the central part of Arabia, heard the Quran being recited in other ways and they were quite upset and they actually came to blows. Hudaifa then, who was up there in Azerbaijan, comes back to Medina and he tells, he says to Uthman, we've got to do something. We've got to make sure that we get one unique Quran so that we don't like the Jews and Christians have many Qurans like they have many Bibles, he was saying. So he, so he insists that Uthman write one Qurayshi Quran and send it to every province. Take this get it into one Qureshi, one dialect, the Qureshi dialect, and send it to Mecca, Medina, Basra, Kufa, and also up to Damascus. Okay, so you have those uh, you have those five cities, and with them are readers to go with each one of them to make sure that they keep it in the Qureshi dialect, to make sure that no other dialect would come upon it and impinge upon it or corrupt it, right? So that was done in 652. And then Uthman took all the other ones. How many of them? We don't know. We just know that he took all the other ones from Kufa and from Basra and also from Damascus, and he burned them. He burned anything that disagreed with the Qureshi dialect. So he took all the ones from the north and all the ones from the east, all right, from the north and the east. That's over here, north and the east. Took them and he burned them, destroyed them. And then he made sure that, that there was only this one dialect, this one, the same one that had, was in heaven, the same one that had been revealed to Muhammad, and the same one that he had now standardized for the whole world in 652. So let's now look back at those 30 get us that we noticed before. There's the 10 ones. Remember the 10 ones that we have there? How many amongst these 10 would have used the Qureshi dialect? Well, let's look at them. Nafi from Medina, they used the Qureshi dialect. Ibn Kathir al-Maki from, he was from Mecca, so he would have used the Qureshi dialect. And Abu Jafar, also from the city of Medina. So there you have three of them. So only three out of the ten readers were Qureshi. Only three were Qureshi. The other seven were all from the places that had been burned. They were all from the cities like Basra and Damascus and Kufa, the three cities where Uthman had their, their manuscripts destroyed. And yet they are the majority of the ten, which are the best of the best. The creme de la creme, according to Yasser Qadi. Has anybody looked at this before? Did anybody pick this up? Am I the first to pick this up? I have never heard anybody talk about this before. Now, what about those who came after? What about the, the transmitters? There they are, the 20 transmitters. How many of their 20 were Qureshi? Well, there you go. Kalu, not Warsh, she was from Egypt. Al-Bazi, Kunbul, Isa ibn Wardan, and Ibn Jumaz. That's it. Of the 20, Five of them were Qureshi. Can you get, do, are you following? That means 15 of them were not Qureshi. And five out of 20, which means of the 30 official Qira'at, only eight use the Qureshi dialect. Only eight, and those are the ones that I have in yellow. There you can see, I've highlighted them so you can see them. That's it, folks. These are the only ones that were using the official dialect, the dialect that Muhammad had, the dialect that supposedly is in heaven, the dialect that Uthman standardized and made sure he sent, he sent all these, these readers along with them to make sure that no other got in the way. And yet of the 30, 22 of them were corrupt. 22 of them should not be there. And yet there they all are. They are the majority. They're the vast majority of the 30 dialects. <laughs> the vast majority are those that are the corrupt dialects, the ones that Hudaifa was so sure must be eradicated so they would not be like the Christians and Jews. Irony of irony. And the one that was chosen, the one that, that, you know, that should have been a Qureshi dialect is Hafs. He wasn't one of the Qureshi dialect. 
He should have been the month of the Kuwaiti dialect. He is from Kufa, the wrong city, the wrong place, the wrong time, the wrong person. In fact, his dialect from Kufa was one which Uthman burned. Now, conclusions. Well, from what we have seen here, the reasons why I believe that Huff should never have been used. Take a look. First of all, Huff's was used, was chosen back in 1924 because they wanted to standardize the tests, the exams for the high schoolers there. Is that a reason why you choose a, a uh, canonized text? Well, okay, some people say, well, there, there's a need for that. Yes, there's a need for that. But do you do it for just the high school? Or should this be, do, be done for all the mosques all over the world? Should this have not been done for all of the madrasas, for all of the students? Why just the high schools there in Cairo? And the reason he was chosen by our good friend Muhammad Ibn Ali al Husseini al Haddad was because of political reasons. He chose him because of the fact that the Ottomans had chosen him. There was no textual um, uh, uh, criticism, no textual uh, research that was done into the text of Hafs to see whether or not it even equated with that of Asim, or whether or not Asim came any close to Ibn Ali Talib, uh, or whether it came close to Ibn Masud's. There was nothing of the sort, nothing had been done, nothing was done to really show whether or not his text corroborated with the earlier text, with the earlier Musafs. None of that. It was chosen for political reasons. And then chosen by the Saudi Arabian government in 1985, 35 years ago, basically out of expediency. They just wanted, a, they really wanted to have a standard Quran. They saw how successful the Egyptian model was, and they wanted to copy the Egyptian model. And they should have thought, they should have thought, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Why in the world did they not choose a Qurayshi dialect? Because that is there from where they're from. They should have chosen a Meccan or Medinan dialect. They should have chosen either Nafi, or they should have chosen Ibn Kathir. They should have chosen, or one of their students. Why didn't they? They chose somebody from Kufa. They went along and they completely eradicated any notion of what Uthman had at the very beginning to standardize the text. And you know good and well that the Arabians, the Saudi Arabians, are proud of their dialect. They're proud of their Arabic. They are, they, they are the creme de la creme of all Arab speakers. But then why in the world didn't they choose a dialect from their Arabic dialect? Why in the world did they allow somebody from Iraq to be the one that would be the canonical text for all the world? Man, I'm, I, I, I don't know if I'm the first one to bring this up, but I'm sure others must have been bringing this up. To me, this is absolutely heinous. It's almost laughable. Now, fascinating, when you choose a text, as we do with the Bible, whenever we go back, and I said this earlier, you always go and you look at the script and you chair, compare word for word. You look and see if there's dialectical difference. Then you go dialect with dialect. And you don't choose that which is different. You choose that which is the same as the original. So the Saudi Arabian government or somebody in Arabia, somebody there in Medina or somebody there in Mecca should have gone through and looked at the Huffs and seen whether or not the text, the script, was exactly the same as that as the Musaf. They should have done wait a minute, wait a minute, they couldn't have, because there is no Musaf from the time of Uthman. There is no Musaf from the 7th century. We don't have any manuscript from the time of Uthman or the time of Muhammad. There is nothing from 632. There is nothing there from 652. There is not even something from Abdul Malik's time. Can you see why they never did any textual historical tech, uh, critical analysis? They couldn't. They had nothing to work with. That's what we're going to be getting to. That's what I can't wait to get to when we get to the manuscript evidence. Therefore, they had to go back to the Kira'ats. That's all they had to go on. All they had to look at were these Kira'ats, which begin to appear in the 8th century, from 36 all the way to 936. Oh, actually 905, but then chosen in 936 by Ibn Mujahid. That's why they only had the 8th, 9th, and 10th century to go on. I'm going to be talking more about that in an upcoming video. Why is that everything we know about Islam, about everything about what we know about Muhammad, what we know about Mecca, what we know about the mosques, what we know about all the manuscripts, everything we know about the Quran, all of it comes from ooh, way over here, much, much later, in the late 8th, 9th, and 10th century redacted back onto the 7th century. See, Muhammad al-Husseini al-Haddad could have chosen any one of the 30 because he really didn't really care. 
He didn't really want to know what was the original text because he knew that if he even asked that question, he would be creating all kinds of maelstrom. There would be an enormous backlash against him because if he were to say, what's the original text that Uthman had? What's the original manuscript that I can go to to see whether Hafs is the best of the best? He would have been told very quickly, you cannot, you dare not, that's the line you don't go beyond, the Yasar Qadi was talking about. You don't ask that question. There are certain questions you just don't ask about the Quran. We have a respect for the Quran, Yasar Qadi says. Well, that's one of the big holes that Yasar Qadi was referring to. They don't even know how to do textual criticism because they don't have any text to do textual criticism. There is no original text, though they have said so. Then they're blue in the face. And as long as I've been uh, working with Muslims, I've heard this over and over again. We need to go. We are the only ones that have the original text. We can trace it. And I remember just a year ago, there on the ladder, Mansur Ahmad made that claim. We can trace the text of the Quran both orally and textually all the way back to the Prophet himself. And then he finally corrected himself by saying, well, up to Uthman himself. And I remember I turned on him. I said, what text are you talking about? What manuscript are you talking about? There is no manuscript from the time of Uthman. We're going to get into that next. But can you now understand why, if you don't have anything to compare it with, if you have nothing to go to from the very original, what is left you, the only thing is left you, are these traditions, these 9th and 10th century traditions, about 10th uh, and up to the 15th century, in this case for the Qira'at, with Al-Jazari. We're talking about much later traditions, where they are just looking at who is the most popular, looking at where, what city they belong to. No one cares diddly swat about what they say or whether or not the vowels are the same or the dots are the same. They don't care any of that because they just want to know who is the most popular, who has the most students underneath them, and which city they come from. And when they finally chose the best of the best, he came from the wrong city, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong people, in the wrong dialect. <laughs> oh, man, it just gets better and better. Okay, God bless you. This is Jay. I'm leaving Florida, heading back up home again. But it's been fun, and it's been good, and it's just terrific to be able to know that we don't have this problem with the Bible. Boy, I'm so glad I don't have to work through this kind of material with the Bible. It's so much better to come back to the Bible, folks. <laughs> we certainly don't make the claims that the Muslims make about their text. And this book has gone through every textual critical analysis, has been doing so for um, 150 to 200 years, and has passed every test. Come on home. God bless you. This is Jay. Over and out. <laughs>